Are you looking to become a better real estate investor? Then hang on because you're about to experience another episode of the world's most popular real estate podcast, The Bigger Pockets Podcast. But before we get to this week's show, I wanted to invite you to become part of our community, biggerpockets.com, the real estate investing social network. The membership is free and you'll instantly gain access to networking opportunities, educational content, investor tools, and more. Sign up now and get a free copy of our book, The Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Real Estate Investing, read by hundreds of thousands of budding entrepreneurs. Just click this link right here or just head to biggerpockets.com. With that, let's get to the show. This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 104. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everybody? This is Josh Dorkin, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my co-host, Mr. Brandon Turner. What up, B? What up, Jay? How you doing? I'm good. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. It's uh you know, it's the that time of year out here in Washington where it's depressing and the sun doesn't shine, but that's all right. So it could be pretty much any day of the year. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> okay. Pretty much. How about you? How how's Denver treating you? It's good. It's good. It's cold again. I I well, uh, I'm a little sick, so you know, I'm a little whiny about that, but you know, above and beyond. You whiny? No. Nah. Josh, Josh Dorkin doesn't whine. Never. No, never. Well, get whatever. over yourself, dude. <laughs> get over yourself. No, th- anyway, well, things this are good. Is our, yeah, this is our second show of, of 2015. That and, it is. And so uh, hopefully, all you guys listening have gotten the ball moving, gotten your goals put together. You guys are motivated and excited. And we, we've got a really exciting show. So yeah. uh, let, let's kind of get into this thing. Brandon, why don't you give us today's quick tip? tip. Quick tip. All right, today's quick tip is if you've not yet checked out the Bigger Pockets file place, you should do it. Biggerpockets.com slash files, and you can go there and download free files like ebooks or forms, or I think there's, uh, I don't know what else is in there, uh, spreadsheets. There are like little analysis things in there. There's marketing tools, all sorts of stuff, hundreds of files in there, and uh, go there, check it out, and download some good stuff today. Yeah, and if you've got files, a, a secondary tip is if you've got any cool files that have helped you with your business, and your processes, things like that, that you want to share, go to the file place and upload them and let other people get access. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I, obviously, share only stuff that that's yours that you own. If if you're sharing stuff that's not, you know, obviously we have to pull it down. But um, please, uh, you know, help other people out. The files that are up there are really really helpful, and and uh, so big thanks to those people who have uh, gotten uploaded their files. There you go. And just as a quick pro benefit of the week, pros can actually download quite a bit more files, I think unlimited actually. So uh, if you are a Bigger Pockets pro member, you go download a whole bunch of files. And if you're not, upgrade at biggerpockets.com slash pro. And, and to clarify, anyone could download files. There's just oh, yeah, it's per a week. weekly cap, yeah, cap yeah, per week, just a yeah. cap on it. So um, awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, so today we've got uh, Todd Whitten from uh, the Atlanta area, correct? We do. And he is awesome. Like he, he is uh, really awesome. He's got a great story. He was actually a, a cabinet maker that was making like, you know, I don't know. He had, I think he said $15 million in sales and then that dropped with the economy. So he started flipping houses and uh, doing some real estate. And now he's, I mean, he's got a pretty massive uh, he's operation. A, he's an adventure traveler. Yeah. And he's doing all sorts of cool, exciting things. And the thing I liked best about today's show was, you know, his focus on systems, processes. And, you know, I think there's stuff in here like, a you know, for Pretty much anybody. If you're a wholesaler, if you're a flipper, if you're a buy and hold guy, you know you're you're going to get something out of the show. So definitely uh, pay attention. So why don't we jump in on this thing and and get it going? Whoa, 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 whoa! Not so fast, not so fast. We still have our sponsor for the day. Let's hear from them right now. Are you running out of leads? It's time you tried Yellow Letters at yellowletters.com. Get motivated seller leads through yellow letters, postcards, zip letters, typed professional letters, greeting cards, door hangers, and business cards. Yellow Letters is a full-service marketing company created with your success in mind. Get the personal attention you need to get your direct mail campaign started and get in touch at yellowletters.com. All right, like I said, yellowletters.com. Check it out. And with that, let's bring in our guest. Josh, would you like to introduce our guest? All right, Todd. Welcome to the show, man. 
Yo, yo, what it is, what it is, gentlemen. Hello, so, welcome. I don't know what, what, what you said, but <laughs> yeah, it, it is what it is, my friend. <laughs> you come to Atlanta and you, you learn how to speak with the natives, so we'll nice. leave it that. Nice, yeah. All right, all right, <laughs> awesome. Well, good to have you. We, we, uh, we have heard good things about you, and, and we're, we're definitely excited to chat with you and learn more. Well, hopefully we'll have enough content to uh, fill up five or ten minutes here. So, oh, oh, hopefully, I don't hopefully, know about that. I don't know about that. <laughs> cool, man. Well, what what what's your story? Tell us, uh, tell us, kind of the quick and dirty. So the quick and dirty, and I guess I actually kind of have like two starts in real estate. So the first start, I was kind of like I was literally born into the business. So my grandfather was a developer: roads, bridges, golf courses, lakes, dams, all that kind of cool stuff. My dad was a builder, and my mom's a uh, landlord, single-family commercial. And when I came home from the hospital, my dad and my granddad were actually in the process of building some multifamily apartments. They had finished one building, so I kind of came home into the unit that they had finished while they were finishing out the rest of the project. So nice. that's kind of the official start. So, so you, were born, right you were literally born into it. Literally born into it. So this nice. is my destiny. Like I have <laughs> no fantastic. Thing. I've I've got to fulfill this thing. So no, very that's cool. cool man. That's cool. All right. Well, and what about the second one? You said you said uh, this happened multiple times. So so, so that's, you were reborn. That was the official start. So <laughs> then there's like the like the start of hey like real estate as a business or whatever. So um, graduated from college, started my own kitchen and bath business. You know, going strong, and then this thing called like the real estate crash happened. And we went from literally about $11 million a year to $2 million a year like that. I mean, Whoa. it wasn't like a slowdown. It was just literally a crash. Yeah. So when you drop about eight figures in annual revenue, like, you know, you got to cut back on some things, and one of which was my paycheck. And so it was like, you know, what do I do to make some end meet? And like early in my 20s, like I'd done like some live-in flips. So just buy a house, do all the work myself, and sell it. Not really thinking about it being like a business. It was just something I enjoyed to do. So when I was like, hey, you know, what are we going to do to make some extra cash? That was just kind of like the natural thing that came to mind. It was like, well, let's just do what we did, buy a house, fix it up, sell it, and see if we can't uh, make a buck or two. Nice, 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 and and the whole live and flip thing is is just buying it, living in it, fixing it, and selling it afterwards. Yeah, yeah. So just being an HGTV addict, it was you know just kind of like seeing it. Like, hey, I want to do that, and I know how to do that. So it's just you know, and it's a great excuse to like buy tools you don't have. So <laughs> nice. like, I need to tile this bathroom. Let me go yep. buy a tile saw. I yep. need to do that. Let me go buy that. And it was just really just an exercise of I just like fixing up properties and, you know, I'd naturally sell them when I'd want to move somewhere else. But it was like, wow, like I just made a ton of money, but didn't really think about it, you know, long term or anything. It was just like a natural byproduct of what I did. That's cool. So did you make a ton of money on those first few live-ins or, or how'd you do? Yeah. I, and the crazy thing is like looking back on the unintentionality of what it was, like those were some of the best deals I've ever done. And granted, that was probably just a product of the market. I mean, that was like the early 2000s, so you really couldn't not make a profit. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, definitely there was some pretty nice uh, returns to be had back in the day, for sure. Well, nice. do you recommend other people kind of get started that way? Like, looking back, do you re- even in today's market, do you recommend new investors get started with a live-in flip? It's a safe way to kind of hedge your bets, so to speak. So, you obviously have to have a place to live. So, if you take the place you need to live and you're, you had that expense anyway, and you, you know, force appreciation. So kind of like in the fix and flip business, that's what we're doing. We're, you know, taking something and we're making it into a better product by doing something to it. So even if you like totally bomb out, suck, don't make a dime, at least you made the place you're living more enjoyable to live in. Yeah. So for anybody just kind of like, you know, starting out, I'd say that's definitely a, a safe way to kind of get your feet wet or put your feelers out there, whether that's something you like to do or not. Yeah. Nice. That's that's one of those like, you know, house hacking techniques that I talk about all the time. Cause I, I love that strategy. Every house I've ever lived in has been a, 
uh, you know, either a small multifamily or it's been a live and flip. I mean, every one that I bought, including the one I'm in right now, we're still kind of fixing this one up. We're almost done with it, but, uh, and I'll probably get it done and I'll move to the next one. And it'll be the same thing just because I love that idea of being able to kind of capture that appreciation or on the multifamily side, the cash flow, uh, and combine that with your, your own home. I mean, if you got to live in somewhere anyway, you have to pay your bills anyway, you might as well make some money doing it. So yeah, I think it's a cool sure. strategy. Um, nice. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. So live in flips, you did that. Uh, that worked out really well. You looked back at, you were doing cabinets. Is that what you said? Yes. Cab- so okay. uh, my dad was a builder and uh, kind of naturally segue from that. Like he did some windows and doors and then got into like kitchen and bath cabinetry. So when I went to uh, high school and college, kind of had a weird story there, but like I went to night school and worked full time for him and his cabinet business. And so I graduated college, sent out a buzz, re- bunch of resumes and nobody replied back. And I was like, huh, what am I going to do for a living? <laughs> nice. And I knew I was like, well, you know, I, I know the cabinet business and I've always like both my parents have always, they've been op- entrepreneurs. Like my mom owned a uniform shop. I just kind of grew up in business and I never really saw myself working for somebody else, but you know, I just figured, Hey, maybe I should. And I was like, well, I, I know I can make this happen. I had some great ideas when I was working for him. So somehow talked my parents into a little bit of money and started my own cabinet company. That's cool. That's cool. Okay. So you went from cabinets, then the market crashed 2007 ish or whatever hit your business dropped out and you decided I'm going to get into flipping. So how did you go from, I want to get into flipping to actually becoming a real estate investor flipper? Can you kind of walk us through that journey? Sure. So, you know, first deal kind of like thinking like, Hey, you know, how can we do this? Um, first needed some capital. So talk my dad out of 50 K and nice. then was talking to a friend of mine who also was like, you know, had some interest in kind of getting into the business. He talked his dad out of 50 K. So we had a hundred thousand dollars to get out there and make something happen. Um, you know, talked to a couple agents, you know, nobody's really given us the time of day. And we finally just found a house that, you know, we put an offer in, somebody actually accepted it. And it was like, well, cool. Like we're, we're actually doing this. So just still kind of, kind of coming from the background of the live-in flip, you know, we both did most of the work ourselves, um, got it all fixed up, put it on the market and like, boom, it sold the first weekend. We were just like, oh my gosh, that's fantastic. And what year was this? Um, 2010-ish. Okay. Okay. Right on. I think so. It's like, we're kind of well into the crash. So yeah, that was back when, you know, looking back now with hindsight, it was hard to screw up in 2000, you know, nine, 10 coming into it. Like stuff was so cheap and the inventory of houses or like, you know, products somebody could move into, you know, our strategy was almost like kind of the same. We could, you know, buy something, fix it up nicer than any other house in that neighborhood, sell it for less expensive than anybody else living in that neighborhood already. So if somebody was going to buy in that neighborhood, it was a new no brainer. They were buying our house. Okay. Yeah. So, so your strategy was to have the nicest house at the cheapest price and, and take just smaller margins on your flips. Yeah, pretty much. And it was, I mean, margin wise, like just because of the nature of the beast, since we were buying stuff so distressed, yeah. you know, still pretty nice margin. We could come in underneath everybody else that had bought, you know, pre-crash and they had zero equity and they just had to, you know, they couldn't sell for what they needed to, to compete with us right. and us having a superior product. It was just, you know, sell, that's sell, awesome. sell. Sure. That's awesome. That's great. So okay, you did all your work yourself at the beginning here, you said, right? Yeah. So the first flip and even just like the living flips, it was just kind of a natural extension of, Hey, like that's just what we need to do. Yep. And well, then that, after that, yeah, I was gonna say, that's not very scalable for the, the level you're at today though. No, not at all. And so. it's, you know, it's, it's something in talking to people getting started out, you know, it just needs to be like, you know, what do you want your business to be? If you just do this because you enjoy it, Hey, I like working on stuff. Then by all means, you know, do the work yourself, but to actually build a business or something that's scalable or something that you can go on vacation or something that, you know, you can pass on or sell to other people. You have to be able to build a system and build a business around, um, be it, flipping or whatever that real estate is. So after we sold the, that first flip, that was kind of like an intentional, like, Hey, let's kind of do real estate investing as a, a job. And it sold, 
you know, kind of the lights went off and it's like, well, let's take everything we've learned, you know, building a successful cabinet business and apply it to real estate. And that's kind of where the real estate business, quote unquote, got started. Sure. And maybe we can talk on that. I mean, what does that mean to run a business like a real estate business like you run a cabinet business? So it's, you know, with any business, it's, you know, building a team around you of people that can do things better than you can. And you as a business owner, you know, really mapping out, you know, where do I want to, you know, what I want this business to be defining, you know, what it is I want it to provide for me. So something that, you know, I'm real big into, uh, you know, family spending time. I've got little kids and I want to make sure that you know, during this time of their life, like I'm there for them. And if I want to be there for them, I can't be at my job sites at 6 a.m., you know, wondering if the concrete truck's showing up, if the lumber's delivered, all this stuff. So, you know, I kind of began with the end in mind and I took a look at, you know, here's how I want my life to be. Here's how I want my lifestyle to be and kind of back that up to, all right, well, here's the stuff I need to delegate and here's the amount of money I want to make. So, you know, just kind of started hiring people, putting people in place, contractors and systems to make that in-game a reality. So, you know, the, the advantage you had, though, is that you came in with a business and you came in probably with a pretty good salary that you paid yourself. And, and so you had the financial wherewithal to to do a lot of that, right? For For somebody who wants to get started in flipping and, you know, they've got the resources potentially to buy the property to to pay for the maintenance do you i mean do you recommend building up more capital to 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 get into flipping so that you can potentially pay pay staff and and have that team or or you know is that just something that worked for you and 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 uh um you know obviously if you can scale up and systematize it so that you can start you know putting a team together then then great so two things there on the, the capital side of things, you, you never want your capital to exceed like what you have going on at any one given time. And it, it's funny because you talk to so many people and that's you know one of the, the biggest hurdles getting started is you know getting capital to get going. But then the opposite problem is having so much capital coming at you. It's like, uh, you know, you hate turning money away, but at the same time, it's, you know, with, with everything I have going on now, can I take this person's capital and effectively deploy it, you know, quick enough and effectively enough to get the type of returns I need to, you know, pay them what they're looking for and it not just be a burden on my business of, oh my gosh, I've just accepted, you know, 100 from this guy, 300 from this guy and 400 from this guy. And I've got $700,000 that I got to figure out what to do with. Yeah. You know, that might sound like a good problem, but it's it's a problem that, you know, you have to think about in your business. So it's like, don't let your capital coming in go with, you know, exceed from what you can do with it. And you're, um, and you're talking about private money there, correct? Private lenders? Yeah. So private lenders and um, like now our business has kind of expanded. Like we've got private money, we've got bank money, and we use both for, for different things. Yeah. But, you know, kind of going back to, you know, somebody just starting off, building flipping as a business, you know, we really shoestringed it from the beginning. It wasn't like we kind of said, oh, we have, you know, a startup fund of $200,000 that we can use as operating capital to yeah. hire these people and and do everything. It was really just, you know, building organically. So the the first piece of the puzzle that we got was our, our project manager. Okay, That was the, you know, I looked at, you know, from the lifestyle perspective, like, I, you know, don't want to be at job sites all the time. I don't want to be running crews. So that was the first thing that it's like, I want to delegate is the construction side. Yep. So, um, friend of a friend, I knew somebody like he had lived in Georgia during the crash. He had to move out to Mississippi and like, he wouldn't get to see his family. It was like a really bad situation. So I was like, Hey, um, I've got this opportunity. You can move back to Georgia. Here's what we've got going on with this flipping business. And, you know, it was a win for him, a win for us. And it was just a, you know, kind of like independent contract arrangement. Here's, you know, a couple hundred bucks a week. Here's what we need you to do. And at the time it, it worked well because, you know, we had a couple flip projects going and it was able to you know, be able to build into the project and kind of self-sustain. 
And then as we you know grew bigger, had more funds coming in, we kind of branched out, started delegating more stuff. But even now, um, you know, just from a business overhead standpoint, we're super mean and lean just from, you know, lessons learned from the crash going from uh, the cabinet company. We had 60 plus people down to, you know, less than 10. So it was like, that was like one of our biggest lessons learned on the way down was, you know, it's, it's easy when businesses are successful to get fat and happy <laughs> and you can just throw money and throw people at things. And it's just like, as a business owner, sit back, relax. And it's like, yeah, this is fantastic. Yeah. And when something adjusts or something, you know, doesn't go right, you know, it's, it's hard letting people go because it's not just, you know, impacting a bottom line, that's impacting a family, that's impacting so many other lives outside yourself. So we really want to be careful that, you know, we're, when we add people or places or whatever, that we're being really intentional about that. So, you know, you talk about the project manager as being kind of that core first guy to, that that allowed you to step out a little bit, even though you know you hadn't even really started. But you know, he, he let you begin the business without you know getting to the sites first thing in the morning and doing all the stuff you didn't want to do. And that's 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 awesome. As you've kind of progressed, I mean, first off, how how big is your team today? And then kind of can you can you tell us who you brought in next and so on until you got to where you are now? Sure. So uh, that same project manager, he's still with us, and he's really like the core backbone of the construction side of the business. Um, next, I brought on a uh, assistant who was kind of like handling uh, QuickBooks, and like luckily she had a real estate license, so it was kind of like you know a double plus good. Here's somebody that can do the books, and you know I've got my license too, but they can take all the calls and stuff that like a licensed quote unquote person is supposed to take. So that took a lot of just the, the paperwork, the busy work, like off of my plate. Yeah. And then as we've, um, kind of grown like into more, uh, projects, a lot of times we'll bring on, you know, partners of projects. And every time we do a partnership deal, it's kind of taking a look at, you know, what am I bringing to the table? What are you bringing to the table? And we'll kind of, you know, divvy up responsibilities and stuff along those points. But, um, now it's really just, uh, me, I've got, uh, two kind of operational partners, my dad, another guy that, uh, used to be in construction a while back and a project manager and we're out there doing what we do. Nice. 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 Um, you mentioned kind of like partnerships. Uh, what do you mean by that? Like what kind of, how do you use partners like that? I mean, are you talking about like just financing partners, like equity partners? Or are you talking about actually like doing a deal together? <laughs> Both. So we've got some, um, you know, financing partners that'll basically just be, you know, just that, like they're just providing the financing on a certain deal. And then we have other partners that we will actually, you know, take a look at a deal and it'll be, you know, not only like an equity partnership, but they're, you know, providing some other aspect, be it, you know, expertise or just kind of coming in on a, you know, bigger project or a different project that we haven't done before. Um, we'll do those types of arrangements too. Okay. Okay. And I know, I know you did one with, uh, uh, kind of our mutual friend, Jay Scott, right? You did a new construction. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about kind of what that was? Yeah. And Jay and I've actually, we, we've done several projects. Okay. But the, uh, the first one was the, uh, like the diary of the new construction project on, you know, Jay did a fantastic thread on bigger pockets, kind of yep. detailing the whole thing out. And it was just a, you know, at the time, I'd never done a new construction project. He never had done one. You know, we both kind of knew we wanted to do it. Uh, a couple of deals came along and, you know, it's like, hey, you want to take a look at these? And the funny thing was, like, so there was the the house that we did the diary of the new construction project on. And there was another one not too far from there that I bought almost simultaneously. I showed, you know, both of them to Jay. We kind of talked about it. And he's like, yeah, let me, uh, you know, I want to do this house. And literally not three days later, a tree falls, smashes, and destroys the other house. <laughs> oh, uh, I was like, Jay, you, you chose wisely. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's crazy. That's crazy. So, and for, for those people listening, we'll, we'll point a link to uh, the diary on uh, the show notes at biggerpockets.com slash show 104. And it's awesome. It's, it literally is this thread that walks you through like the purchase all the way to the uh, yeah, the teardown and, and the construction and the sale of 
this new construction project and it 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 doesn't leave a detail out it's if you've ever considered doing some kind of a uh, new build or even flip or, or even as a landlord, you got to check this thread out. It's, it's fantastic. And it's got hundreds and hundreds of posts in it. So definitely uh, worthy. So, so what, what'd you do with the property that the tree fell on? So that one, that wasn't the only problem with this house. That, if I kind of compiled it, like all like the horror stories of my real estate career, <laughs> probably about 70% of them can tie back to this other house. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, so not only did a tree fall and like obliterate the house. So that kind of like took it off my burner for a couple months. I was having to you know deal with the insurance and all that. And it was just kind of out of sight, out of mind. So then I go to, uh, you know, we get the insurance settlement and go to actually like start rehab. I go to pull the permits and I'm like, huh, like the, Description's not matching up. So it turns out like I actually, I bought the house. And if you can imagine just like this huge fenced in yard, it was fenced in from the street all the way back. But apparently I only bought half the land this house was sitting on. <laughs> it was How on a, uh, earth did that happen? So there was some, some less this, than honest sellers and a less intelligent buyer, that would be me, yeah. that didn't really do my proper due diligence and like they acquired the property through a tax sale and you know way back in the 20s or 30s whenever this house was built the person bought three lots they built their house you know almost in the middle of the three but the city of Atlanta like split that into two tax parcels so when they like the homeowner died you know there's nobody in her state so of course you know it went into you know be sold at a tax auction and they bought the parcel that had the house primarily on it, not the other one. And so long story short, like the closing attorney we closed it with, he kind of knew all about this and it turned into this big mess and it was just like, you know, what do I do? So I had to, you know, learn like, you know, what is a tax sale? Like how does one acquire something that, you know, could possibly be sold at a tax sale? I uh, ended up going to the tax sale. Luckily, nobody bid it against me. I purchased the tax deed to the property and um, talked to another investor, ended up selling him the the deal. That was one of those, like, you know, I, I could have held on to it, built it. It would have been a fantastic lot, but I didn't want to see that on my whiteboard. I was like, you know, like, that project is just cursed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so how would somebody avoid that? I mean, what what can we as investors do to make sure that we don't end up buying a property, uh, buying a house on a third of the, the lot that the house actually sits on. So, you know, I look at that as like, you know, many lessons learned. So as part of our due diligence process now, we always make sure, uh, number one, like, you know, your contracts, make sure they always reference the true legal description of the property. Never, you know, having your contract, I'm buying one, two, three Maple Street. Because That's great, great advice. One, two, three Maple Street might have an oak and an elm that you don't know about on there. So always make sure that, you know, the actual true legal description, the meets and bounds, hey, this property goes 50 feet that way, 100 feet that way, blah, blah, blah. Yep. Make sure that's referenced in your contract. Then, um, especially if you're going to do like new construction or like any type of addition, something that, you know, you're not just improving the inside of a house. Like, hey, I need to know my setbacks. I, it's really critical, you know, where I can go on this property. Make sure you get a survey done and make that, you know, like an exhibit to your contract. And then as an investor, do your own due diligence, make sure these meet up. So I look at my deed, it says I'm going, you know, A, B, and C. Make sure that survey, you know, have a highlighter in your hand and literally go through the survey, making sure that everything lines up and you know exactly what you're purchasing. So uh, there's no way that you can, I mean, is, there's no simple way to kind of automate that or, or you know, w when you get a title policy, does that kind of cover you? I mean, what, what can people really, I mean, like to me, it's it's like, you know, hey, I want to buy this property on the purchase contract. You really want to make sure you're reading that purchase contract thoroughly. And, but but the question is like, what if the purchase contract had on it, you know, hey, we're selling, you know, one, two, three Main Street. You know, and it didn't have the parcel identification on the on the contract. What would somebody do at that point? 
Or what should well, they, they do? You kind of end up like in my situation where yeah. like you, I bought something that wasn't what I expected it to be. And then you have to go through like, you know, how do I fix this problem? So yeah. luckily I was able to, you know, fix the problem by purchasing the tax deed and, you know, putting it together. And, and that wasn't the end of it. Like you've got to wait a year, you've got to do all this legal mumbo jumbo to actually perfect the title and, and make it happen. But, you know, I, I was kind of fortunate. And I've talked to a lot of people that have ended up in similar situations of you didn't quite purchase what you think you were purchasing. And then it's just the sky's the limit to the horrible, bad things that could happen to you <laughs> in your pocketbook. Oh, yeah. So, you know, you've just got to roll with the punches and do what you can to pick yourself up and limit the damages on that type of transaction. Uh, sounds yeah. horrible. Well, <laughs> th- thank you for sharing, though. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, I think it's helpful for those people who didn't even know this was possible. Yeah. Oh yeah, you yeah. can uh you can definitely use, lose a dollar or two out there for sure. Well, and I yeah. think I think that's kind of one of the kind of going back to the the whole business idea you're talking about flipping as a business, right? Like not every business transaction is going to work out. So, I mean, like if you're kind of person who flips one house a year and you rely entirely on that income to survive and that one deal goes bad one year, you lose all your income. But if you have a business that works multiple flips and you have, you know, systems and processes and people and you're and you're doing things, if one goes bad, the other ones kind of cover for you. Same thing as having one rental property versus, you know, a dozen. If something goes vacant, you can still survive. So I think just kind of ties that in a little bit. But let me let me shift gears a little bit and ask you about uh your experience and like to that to today. I mean, how many deals have you done now and what do they look like typically? Uh so we're well north of 50 now, and it's been a you know pretty good mix of fix and flips, and it's kind of evolved over the years. Like this year, just as a whole, like we're doing a lot more like luxury new construction. Uh, we just started like our first pop top project where we're taking the roof off a house, building a second story on it, um, and we've got a couple of those going now. So we've done wholesale deals, buy and holds. You know, kind of our, or at least my philosophy is like the more types of deals I learn how to do and the more tricks we have in our tool bag, you know, the more, you know, deals when they come across my desk, like, you know, I can take advantage of, you know, in some way or another. It's not just limiting ourselves to, you know, oh, like we're only going to, you know, fix and flip cosmetic rehabs or we're only going to do this. It's, you know, just trying to expand in our experience and expand our deal base so we can take advantage of, you know, whatever type of opportunities we, we see. Cool. And, and you you keep saying we we is that you and your company do you have a partner also in it? like I mean I know we talked earlier about partners but is there like a a partner in the business itself in the core business? So pretty much everything is is a we like like I, I try not to uh, to take credit for anything because definitely sure. like I would not be where I am today without the the we sure and sure okay. The we is everything from transactional partners on um, individual flips to like just like is the business as a whole. So kind of this year as we transitioned into like a more new construction type um, entity, we brought on another partner that had a ton of experience in new construction and is kind of like, you know, just taking the business in bigger and bolder directions than, you know, I ever would. Yeah. So, you know, definitely I'm a big proponent of, you know, going further faster by bringing on team members, partners, anybody that I can like, you know, get into my inner circle to take me where I want to go. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. You you talked about pop tops. Um, that happens a ton in my neighborhood uh, here in, in Denver and, and, you know, you got these 1950s houses that people are just, you know, taking the roof off and throwing another story on top and, and cleaning it up. Uh, t- tell us a little bit about that as a strategy. Um, wh- you know, what, what kind of property would be ideal for something like that? What, what are kind of, I don't know if you could potentially talk about the numbers on a, a deal that you've done uh, a pop on and yeah, just fill us in a little bit more on that. Sure. So like this first pop top deal, um, number wise, like acquisition, I think we paid like two twenty, two twenty five, and like the homeowners actually, you know, it was an off market deal. They were wanting to, you know, kind of live in their same area, but the area was so hot. Anytime a house would come up, like it was just instantly gone. So yeah. it's like to them, the idea of you know they wanted the headache or like the stress of selling their house 
you know, they wanted it sold, but then they wanted to, you know, sit back, relax and be able to, you know, purchase like where they wanted to go. So one of the agents we worked with, like she brought us a deal and it was just kind of one of her friends that had been talking. So we purchased from them. They rented it back from us for two to three months and then they moved. So our out price, like we've actually got two or three projects going on on the same side of town. New construction comps, you're like in the high fives to 700s. And we kind of looked at, you know, if we can put a, a semi new product into that same market range, like we can probably hit the low fives without, you know, too much of a stretch. So our out price is 525 and our rehab, I think it's going to be somewhere in like the 150 to 175 range. Um, kind of depending on like we're building a detached garage, but it wasn't part of the original plan. So that's kind of adding to our rehab costs. So yeah. uh, it hopefully be a, uh, you know, at least a six figure payback at the end, but yeah. Um, that's cool. That's yeah. I mean, it's more profitable than I thought. I mean, that, do you think that's just because you got an incredibly good deal on that or are those fairly typical for, for pop tops? Well, you know, here again, like whether it's a pop top, a rehab or like a teardown, it's, you know, it's all about like, you know, what is that, you know, what's that end game? So like this part of town is uh, in town Atlanta, but it's an incredible public school system. So it's so in demand for, you know, somebody to be here, but like, Hey, I'm not having to spend fifteen, twenty thousand $20,000 a year on private school for each of my kids. I'm willing to pay a premium for, you know, a house in this area. And, you know, people want that, that new house, they want the energy efficiency, they want the high ceilings, but, you know, they can't get that with the existing product in that area. So it's, you know, then it's the question of, Hey, do we just tear this down from scratch or do we look at doing a, a pop top? And, you know, this one could have gone either way. Like we had honestly bought it with the intention of just bulldozing it down and just, you know, doing a build back. But we just really wanted to try and do a pop top. So it's like, Hey, like number wise, it looks like it'll work. And, you know, let's see, let's just give it a shot. So that's kind of how this one turned into a pop top. Nice. So, do you, so you go into this, um, with, with, the uh, the experience of of having rehab flipped houses, you went into the new construction project diary project um, with the same experience. Do you think it would be foolish or wise of of a new investor to to pull uh, together a project like a pop top or a new construction build, or should they wait uh, until they've got a little more experience? Well, I think it all just depends on like the team you have around you. So. You know, any new investor, like, you know, when they're coming, like, I always, like, you know, kind of talk to them, like, you know, what's your background? Like, you know, what do you feel comfortable with? Or what are, like, the holes in your team that you need to fill to, you know, do what you want to do in real estate? So, you know, depending on um, who they have. So for us, like, like, I've got my GC license, you know, I've got a little bit of experience in, you know, building stuff back. But like one of our framing crews, like this guy, like, that's all he does is pop tops. I mean, that's just. He wakes up, he pops the top, he goes to bed, he does it again tomorrow. So, you know, just kind of like we've used him on some smaller flips, just doing some framing, some deck builds, and kind of talked to him about that. And, you know, if, if I didn't have that piece of the puzzle in place, like I probably would not have, you know, attempted that until I, you know, knew more about it or had that. So having that guy on our team, I was like, well, you know, I, I think we can pull this off. Let's Let's go do it. But for anybody that's just, you know, hey, I just want to go pop a top or, hey, I want to go tear something down. It's like if you don't have the like the resources and the contacts in your inner circle, like, you know, you might bite off more than you can chew. I think that's great. I think it's great. You know, I think a lot of people stop and say, hey, you know, I I can't do that. I've never done a deal. I don't have the capacity to to go ahead and do that. But, you know, by by teaming up with the right people and 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 just you know, bu- building that, that knowledge base, you could pretty much do anything is what, is, is what you're saying. I mean, uh, obviously you're probably going to get a smaller piece of the pie, uh, due to your lack of knowledge, un- unless you bring in maybe lots of capital, all, or all the financing. But, but, you know, if, if, you know, I said today, Hey, I want to go and build something or pop something, you know, and I know nothing, if I could grab you and, and, and Jay and some other guys or whatever it is, you know, who, who've done this before, you know, why not? 
Absolutely. And it, it really just comes back like, you know, like one of my all-time like favorite quotes or like things to think about is, you know, whether in real estate business or life is like, you know, the question of how. It's like, how do I answer that question of, you know, I, I don't know how to, you know, build new construction. Well, you know, how do I do that? And it's, you know, do I need a contractor? Do I need money? Do I need time? Like, what are the things that I don't have and how do I get those things? Right. And the people that can successfully answer that question and plug in those pieces to, you know, what they're lacking themselves are, like you said, you can do anything, whether yeah. new construction, pop top, or, you know, start some, you know, internet business. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, cool. Uh, let me a- ask you, go back. You kind of touched on this a minute ago, but how do you decide on a project if you're going to rehab it, pop top, or tear it down? I mean, you got a, a house in front of you. Is it just numbers and math? I know on the pop top, you just wanted to go with it, but you know, typically how do you look at the three? So it's, you know, at the end of the day, it is just like, you know, numbers and math. So in time, because time is such a great cost to business, whether it's my own capital that's invested in a project or an investor's project or, you know, capital invested into a project, you know, carry costs, especially on like these bigger projects are such a huge part and a huge number of the equation that, you know, time really comes into play. So especially like inner city, you know, Atlanta, where we've got permitting offices, if we acquire something today, it might be, you know, nine months before we have something to sell. And that's a huge piece of the equation. If it's just like a simple rehab, you know, we can be, you know, boom, in and out in a couple weeks, couple months, like, you know, but we're not going to get as much on the back end. And like, so this pop top's kind of like a quasi of the two, like, we don't have near like the time in permitting and planning that we do it on a new construction, but because we're changing more than just like, you know, paint and carpet, like we're, you know, raising the ceilings to, you know, nine or 10 feet, we're opening up the floor plan, we're creating a product that's, you know, more close to a new construction prod- product, but we're able to do it on a much faster timeline. So yeah. it's really, you know, between time and dollars, like, What's our shortest path to the most dollars? You know, I, I, a lot of people, I, I'd say, especially the, the, the new guys, don't really consider time. You know, it's, it's one of those things on, on a rehab, on, on a build, on a, on a teardown. You know, those, that's, that's that factor that you, you've got to figure out, right? You've got to figure that out. It's, it's kind of like the, you know, on the buy and hold side, you know, a lot of people want to say, hey, I'm, gonna, um, I'm not going to account for property management. Uh, because I'm going to manage it myself. Well, that's a cost. It's your time, and there is a cost, and you should apply it. You know, you should factor that in whenever you're when, whenever you're you're uh, purchasing a, a buy and hold property. Well, the same the same goes into play on on these other types of properties, on flips and 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 uh, builds. The time factor is is huge. It's huge. So, you know, what advice do you have on on that on factoring time? Because I think that's one of the places where people often get it wrong. Absolutely. And, and the biggest thing that you know, they don't realize is, you know, there is a, a cost and that cost is an opportunity cost to be at your capital or your time. You know, yeah. so many people are like, oh, you know, I use my own money on this deal. So, you know, like, should I hold on to it another six months and see if it sells or whatever? And it's like, you know, no, like sell it now, get out, you know, lose money on this deal, whatever you need to do to to move on. Because, you know, when your capital is tied up, in point A, not making you any money, you know, you're not making a return on projects B, C, and D that you could be out there making happen right now. Yeah. You know, the same thing goes with time. Like people like, oh, well, you know, whether it's I'm doing my own work on this project or, you know, I'm going to, you know, lick all these letters and stamps and do this myself. It's like if that's not your highest and best use, you're not, you know, making yourself all that you can be. You're just, you know, you are losing money by not, deploying your physical and mental self in its highest and best use. Preacher, brother. Amen. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Cool. That's awesome. Um, let me, let me go to, let me go to one more topic, uh, finding deals. How do you get them? Uh, and is that changing in your market today? Uh, it pretty much changes every day. So over the years, like we built a pretty good network of agents, of wholesalers, 
um, and just putting the word out there like, you know, hey, we do real estate, you know, here's the type of stuff we do. And like, I've got my real estate license. So um, occasionally, like I'll find a deal. So we've got a pretty good network and a pretty good diversification of deal flow. And, you know, now, like, honestly, the biggest challenge we have is a prioritization of deal flow because it's literally every day is just stuff coming down the pipe. Hey, look at this, look at this, look at that. And I could spend all my time every day just looking at deals, people calling me that day, but, you know, it's just a sense of overwhelm. So it's, you know, putting those deal filters in place, you know, knowing like, hey, here's the stuff I'm looking for and being really disciplined about that because, you know, otherwise it's just like, oh my gosh, like uh, you, you, I couldn't do any deals because there's so many deals flying at you. Nice, nice. Cool. Well, so, you know, I, I guess I want to ask, do you, do you have any other, you know, you told, told us some interesting stories. I, I mean, what, what was like outside of that property, that one property that was just a nightmare with, with uh, the, the, the tax, tax liens? I mean, do you have any other horror stories or any, anything interesting, fun that you want to share? Well, you know, I think that a lot of the horror stories kind of go back to, you know, also like, you know, how do you want to, you know, be successful in real estate or how do you want your reputation to be, you know, taken in? And it's like, you know, are you in this for the short term? Like, hey, I just want to make a buck on this deal. Or are you in this for the long term? Like, you know, I want to be somebody that's known in the city and from agents as somebody that stands behind their product and, you know, does the right thing. So, you know, looking at like, you know, dollars lost or like, oh my gosh, like, uh, I can't believe that happened. It's, it all kind of comes back to, you know, beating this game for the long haul. Like, uh, you know, we've learned, you know, kind of with that in mind, you know, if we're going to provide a warranty and stand behind our work, we need to use, you know, contractors that have been in business a long time that also kind of have that same philosophy. We need to use products, you know, from national manufacturers that have a warranty, like um, pretty close to like when we first got to start investing, like we maybe had done like three or four deals. We found this discontinued flooring at like, you know, one of those flooring discount, whatever centers. It was just, yep. I mean, it looked amazing. It was so cheap. It was just like, oh my gosh, like this is God's gift of flooring and we're buying all of it. And we literally like, you know, bought like four or five pallets of this stuff. They like shipped it into our warehouse and we were just putting it everywhere we could. Well, the only problem was like, I don't know, maybe like six, seven months after we installed all these houses with this flooring, like the top layer of the floor started peeling up Oh man! and it wasn't just one house. It was like all these houses. So it's like, what do we do? And we replaced a lot of flooring. And it was just, you know, it's not like we were required to do that or or anything else, but it was like, you know, if this is what we're going to do and who we want to be, like, we're going to have to to eat it to, you know, be successful. Did you That's say, great. did you say you warranty your flips as well? Yeah. So, you know, and with that, there is a, we're obviously not like warrantying the whole entire thing. So on our flips, like we always, always, um, even though like, you know, up front we'll say, oh, there's no home, home warranty included. We always kind of like make that like a point of negotiation that we make the other party think that like they won something, even though that like we're pretty much going to force you to buy a home warranty just from the fact that takes so many of the little headaches off of, hey, you know, the HVAC isn't working, this, that, the other, like, you know, I'd rather you call, you know, them than, you know, burden our staff. And you know, in past that, it's always just like a judgment call. It's, you know, granted, like, you know, our philosophy or like what we're going to do, we're going to get in there, we're going to take care of all the issues we know about all the issues that we see, and do the best job we can. But as anybody in this business knows, like, you're not going to find everything, you're not going to know about everything. And like, you know, a house, even if you build it from scratch is far from perfect. So, you know, when issues arise, it's just a judgment call of, hey, you know, I just put myself in the buyer's shoes. Like if if like, Hey, I I bought this house from this guy. So if I, you know, flip it around and it's like, Hey, if I bought this house from them, is it right for me to, to do this? And sometimes it is. And sometimes it isn't. How far out will you, would you, would you go? I, I, I mean, you know, I, I take both sides on this one, you know, having not flipped a house, 
you know, but having purchased a house that had issues, you know, I know that my job was to hire an inspector and the inspector is supposed to go through and look for everything. But I've never bought a property where the inspectors found everything. And I always curse and yell at this inspector, you know, in my own head. I'm always like, you know, this SOB, you know, how do you miss that? And, and, you know, and then I'm typically left holding the bag and I, I've got to deal with it, right? So, I, A, I think it's awesome that you, you do warranty it to, to some extent, but how, how far w- would, you, would you take it? You know, are you going to go six months, a year? I mean, if I call you in three years and like, hey, this thing that we all missed, you missed, the inspectors missed, and I missed, you know, that's a major problem now. You know, are you going to come in then or, or is it kind of like, eh? So like, like, you know, take our new construction, for instance. So like just in our market as a whole, like it's just like there's a an understood and just kind of like the market um, standards, like a one year warranty. And that's on a complete new build. Yeah. And even on like the flip stuff, I kind of use that like as a barometer, but it really just kind of goes back to, you know, is this a material defect? Is this, you know, something else that like nobody would have known? And you just you just never know, like a good example uh uh, flip we did a couple years ago. Um, this is when we actually hired like an outside, like we didn't GC this one ourselves. We hired a different contractor to like do this renovation for us. And we're literally like, you know, showing up, doing the final punch out, you know, touching up paint and we finished the basement on this house. And the, the GC superintendent was like, Hey, uh, you know, this basement's been leaking the whole time we've been doing this rehab. I was like, I actually, I did not know the basement has been leaking the whole time we've been doing this rehab. And I'm just finding out about this now. And like the basement's <laughs> finished and there's walls and floors. And oh, he's man. like, yep. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and so the homeowner is like, you know, standing right there and they're like, well, what do you mean the basement's leaking? So like, you know, me as the investor and the homeowner is the person buying it is like, what are you talking about? So, uh, you know, the home inspector, you know, this is just like one of those like perfect storm types of things. So he, you know, obviously like the homeowner's like, Hey, like I'm concerned, like there's like a leak here in the basement. So what does he do? So during the course of the home inspection, he turns on the hose bib and lets it run the entire few hours that he's there. So, you know, it's not just like, Hey, here's a little bit of rainfall and it leaks a little bit. This guy probably just put like 10 years worth of rainfall into our <laughs> basement in the span of two hours. And it just way flooded. So here we are at the last minute, you know, they've got their home inspection. We've got the contract. Like they actually, you know, put a contract on this house early on in the process. So this house is like customized to them. It's got their tile, their wall colors, their countertop colors. You know, this is their house. And what are we going to do? So, you know, we sign a letter at closing. We close the house and actually we come back in after the fact, rip out the entire wall. We put in a you know, really expensive internal drainage system and, you know, make it to where, like, the basement doesn't leak anymore. But, you know, that was, I think, like, nine grand out of our pocket, you know, after closing for something that, like, you know, it was just, like, oops. Yeah, that's crazy. And that sucks. That really, uh, that, that's unfortunate. And, what, and, and my last question on, on this line of, of discussion here is, what did you do with the contractors? I mean, you know, I would be livid. Right? And, and, frankly, I'd be livid at my uh, project manager for not having caught that either. Yeah. And uh, we obviously never use them again. And, yeah. uh, and, and it's a shame because like it, you know, it's kind of a friend of a friend and it looked like it could be like something, you know, a great relationship going forward. And it just, you know, didn't work out like that wasn't the only major, major issue we had with these guys on several different projects. And it was really something we couldn't even fault like our own project manager because, you know, at the time, like the whole reason we hired this other contractor, you know, we had so much going in different parts of town that like, you know, he was covered up on his own stuff and it was just kind of like, you know, we, um, you know, this was almost like, you know, like a full service GC, like they were basically quarterbacking it. They were bringing in their own subs, doing the whole thing. Whereas, yeah. you know, even now, like our project manager, like we'll hire quote unquote contractors or quote unquote GCs to do bits and pieces of jobs that we're, you know, we're quarterbacking it. We're pulling the permits. We're, you know, kind of coordinating the whole thing. But, you know, this one, they were, you know, basically just shooting us pictures every now and then. And, you know, the, the idea was they hand us the keys when they're done renovating it and we sell the house, but it didn't work out that way. Right on, right on. All right, so we're going to move on uh, to the fire round. But before we do, I wanted to ask one more question. Uh, your BiggerPockets profile said you are a world adventurer. What does that mean? 
So, you know, kind of like a, uh, like a hobby or a passion of mine is, you know, travel, but not just, you can only spend so many weeks a year just laying on the beach, sipping fruity cocktails. So that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> There's no find- limit to, to, to how long I can do that. <laughs> You're, you're just really hardening not. hard enough when you get there. <laughs> there you go. My, my limit's like a week. All right. So, so what does that mean? What else do you do? So, you know, it's, it's traveling to, you know, places and experiencing things you just don't normally do. So, like, like I prefer, like, third world countries. So, be it, you know, Ecuador, the Galapagos Islands, like, something to where it's, you know, it's not just a vacation, but it's a challenge. It's like, you know, I don't really speak the language. I don't really know the culture. And I want to, you know do something. So, and I've actually been fortunate enough to do like a really cool, like, you know, kind of coupling vacations with like something like, you know, bigger and better. So I've produced a rock concert in Eastern Europe. I've gotten to go to Ukraine and teach small business skills to aspiring entrepreneurs. And wow. so it's like the, the best that's, of both worlds. It's cool. like, I'm um, you know, getting to, to take a vacation, but I'm actually, you know, getting to, you know, apply myself and better other people and all those things, uh, kind of coming that's together awesome. nice that's it, really cool really really, really cool like with the uh like the ukraine thing if there's anybody out there that like you know has a heart for business or like you know a heart for like you know helping people i found this uh organization is called global leadership and what they do is basically take you know business people here from the united states you know it's usually you know ceos sales managers people that have like you know a great story to tell or like some tremendous business experience uh, you kind of go over there as a team, five to six people, and put on like a you know like a business symposium. So everybody will kind of take their area of expertise. You kind of come up with workshops, and the thirst for you know knowledge or just you know just the things we take for granted here in America of transacting business. Like hey, like I hand you a contract, and you know I don't necessarily need to have my lawyer read it word for word. Well, over there it's just not the same. So it's kind of uh, eye-opening experience for an American entrepreneur, you know, taking things like, you know, trust and like the legal judicial system for granted and, you know, teaching them like, you know, skills, but then also kind of hearing, yeah, that might work over there, but, you know, that's not the way it goes over here kind of thing. So yeah. definitely anybody that, you know, wants to, you know, kind of help people out, check out that organization and it's a really awesome experience. Oh, nice. All right, we're moving on. It's time for the fire round. First question I have in the fire round is going to be: Where, Where's all the enthusiasm? You're sorry, dramatic you know, and enthusiastic. all right, oh, fine. Kind of, like, kind of flat, uh, Brandon. Like fire, like exploding. All right, fine, yeah. fine. Here we go. Here we go. Let me let me do it the right way. All right, all right. It's time for the fire round. Woo! Let's get it on. Let's get it on. All right. A little, little much. That's okay. pretty good. All right. You know, that's how, that's how I go. All right. My first question of the fire round, this comes from the forums and I just grabbed it just now. The question is, do you have any good, I know we just passed the holiday season, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Do you have any good uh, gift ideas or things to thank your contractors? Any way to thank a contractor? Thank a contractor. Well, I think that would depend on the contractor and like, you know, what it is, you know, how could I use this gift as something to help them in their business? You know, do they need like a tape measure? Maybe they've you know miscut some things over the year. Maybe they hadn't done what they need. So I'm going to buy this guy a laser tape measure to kind of further his career. Um, we actually just had a uh, like this pop top. I get a call. It's like, hey, uh, the inspector here, and he uh, we got to rip off the entire roof again because the house is built two feet too high. I'm like, what do you mean the house is built two feet too high? <laughs> it's like, well, I just watched him measure it like. Uh, yeah, he said the house is, you know, 37 feet too high and we can only be 35 feet. And I was like, well, did you measure it? And he's like, well, I saw him do it. And I was like, we'll just measure it anyways. And so sure enough, like the inspector, like mismeasured the roof line of our house. And, you know, we took the laser tape, shot it, and we were, you know, five feet under where we needed to be. So um, that inspector will definitely be getting a uh, <laughs> a laser tape measure in his Christmas goodie bag this year. That's hysterical. That's nice. great. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right. What should a flipper do if they run out of money on a half-finished flip? So, obviously, you have to take it to the finish line. So, you have to take a look at, you know, how do I get this done? And it could be something as simple as, like, hey, I'm out of money. It's half-finished. Is the as-is value something that I could – and you never know. You might be able to make a buck on the as-is value of where you have it now. Or, you know, is it, you know, 
underwater, like I'm going to lose money? Is it something I could go find, you know, another investor to bring into the deal and, you know, bring in his capital to, you know, take it? Obviously, you're going to get a smaller portion of the pie, but something may be better than nothing. Nice. Cool. I like it. Uh, Let's see. Should I fix and flip a house to pay for my upcoming wedding? I've never flipped a house before. I need money to pay for the wedding. Should I fix and flip to pay for my wedding? Now, like, I don't know if you like talk to my wife to get this question. (laughs) (laughs) I I actually have real world experience with this. So um, my wife and I, like right before we got married, um, you know, needed some money to pay for our wedding. Well, she had a house and I had a house. And I was like, well, hey, I can, uh, you know, it's kind of like Property Brothers. Let me come in here and I can fix this place up and, you know, sell it. And we're going to pay for our wedding, you know, with the profits we make from flipping your house. Well, this was like in 2007. And so we put a bunch of money into her house to sell it, put a for sale sign in the yard, and the crash happened. Yep. So I actually still own that property today as a buy and hold. Um, so the answer would be no. <laughs> Do not flip a house if you want to pay for a wedding. That's funny. You, you, you just never know. And it, whether it be a market correction or a deal gone south, you never want to base your future or anything else on a transaction. That's good. That's good. That is yeah. good advice. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't think of it when I wrote the question, but I actually had, or you know, when I grabbed the question and wrote it here. But I actually had the exact same situation where when we were getting married, we didn't have any money for the wedding, and so I did. I did my first live-in flip, and I used all the money and it paid for my wedding. So I actually, it, it worked out in my case. But I sold mine. It was also two thousand seven, right? But I sold mine like as we were like looking over the 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 pit, I guess, of where we were about to go. So I got out at just the right time. But anyway, nice. yeah. So well, I, way to way to put salt in the wound there. For, uh, <laughs> oh, for yeah, it worked out pretty good for me. I don't know if you were a good contractor and a good flipper. Jeez. You might have done all right, but you know, yeah, I, just, I just sucked it up. But yeah. I, really, I think the moral of the story there for for anybody out there is, you know, whether you have a wedding to pay for or anything else, like you know, this business is so unpredictable. You just you never want to stake your family's future, your business future, anything else on, you know, a single or even like multiple, you know, it's, it's just, you just never know. So it's, you don't want to, you have to take calculated risk and you don't want to put all your eggs in a basket at the last minute and have them come crushing down. Makes sense. Makes sense. Word. All right. Last, uh, last question for me on this, uh, this section of the fire round. Uh, I want to flip a project that has six foot basement ceilings. Any ideas? Well, are you wanting to have a basement in this house you are flipping with six foot basement ceilings? I, I don't know. I don't it's know. not my question. <laughs> you know, I'm just, you know, regurgitating so, what was, you know, I'm just a talking dummy here that just <laughs> blah, 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 they put in front of me and I have to say it. So it's, it's true. Um, I, I, yeah. I, I don't know the intent here, um, but hey, let me read. I, I can I read. Assume. Let me let me read the entire question. This is from Brandon Sturgill on the on the forums. He said, "I have a potential investment property for rehab that has good potential in the main living area, but the basement ceiling is six foot high. The space is not realistically usable. Anyone have any excess at rehabbing similar properties? It seems like the cost to make it presentable outweighs any potential increase in ARV." That was the actual so- question. Like we've got a couple projects right now we're working on, like you know, similar and actually both our pop top projects. You know, they have, you know, a basement that you would not consider. We couldn't convert it into living space, but it is great storage space. So you know, we're packaging it, marketing it as, hey, look at all this extra storage space you get that you wouldn't have, like if it was a slab house or a crawl space house. But you know, the same kind of thing. Like our cost to dig the basement lower and or raise the house off its foundation and make it a livable, you know, eight or nine foot basement, you know, the number doesn't work out to make that livable space. So, you know, take what you have, you know, put some real estate speak on it and turn it into a positive and, you know, let it be an enhancer, not a profit detractor. Cool. Fair enough. Fair enough. It's a good answer. All right. My final question of the fire round is uh, a little self-serving, but that's all right. How do you use bigger pockets? Or you can kind of rephrase it as what value has it brought to you? So, you know, literally like throughout the years, like, I mean, it's, it's been such a great resource that, um, you know, just starting out, it was kind of like a sounding board for, you know, just, I want somebody that knows what they're doing to tell me what I'm about to do is a good or a bad idea. And just the relationships that it's brought about, like, 
um, from meeting Jay Scott to he recently just countless other people, sources of money. It's just been an incredible tool to further our business in every way imaginable, for sure. That's awesome. Cool. Cool. All right. All right. Let's move on to the world's famous. Famous for. There's no guns in this one, Josh. <laughs> oh, whoops. <laughs> All right. The famous. We need to add some for the next <laughs> yeah. go round. Yeah, we might. <laughs> I don't the know. The famous yeah. for. <laughs> maybe some cannons and some. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> like pi- pirate music. That's what I'm thinking. And it's going nice. to be amazing. All right. Famous for. Uh, number one. What is your favorite real estate related book? Favorite real estate related book? That would have to be the J. Scott book on flipping houses. Yeah, the book on flipping houses. Excellent nice. book. Which can be picked up at biggerpockets.com slash flipping book. That it can. All right, next question, Josh. Next question is what is your favorite business book? So, favorite business book. I was actually talking to uh, your assistant, Hillary, and I think this question needs to be changed to what is your favorite business book? Other than the four-hour work week, <laughs> well, you know, whatever, man. Listen, it, the book is, is solid. I've read it. it I, you know, fantastic. I keep, I continue to get grief over the, this book, even though I finished it months ago. Whatever, whatever. It, Next it, question. <laughs> you know, interview, interview over. <laughs> Drops mic. <laughs> okay. All right. So anyway, four-hour work week. Is that your answer? And, and why? Yeah, it, well, it's fantastic. But like, since so many people. And justifiably, like it's a fantastic book, like it just gives you the mindset of, you know, setting up your business outside yourself and everything else. But um, just to kind of get outside the box and do something different, I was like, well, let's go e-myth. But then a lot of people say that too. So uh, I'm going to give a shout out to David Allen and his book, Getting Things Done, yeah, or the book. GTD Method. There you cool. go. Are I like you, it. Are you a uh, successful GTD user? It, it, it's hard. Absolutely not. <laughs> but the idea because I tried and I failed too, by the way. Yeah, I strive for it. Like, you know, I, I get my Evernote set up and I've got all these like shorthands and action symbols and this, that, the other, and it'll work great for a week and then it just gets overwhelmed. Yeah. But it's something that eventually I'll figure it out. And get things done. Well, what I find about the the getting things done system is like we should probably just get David Allen on the podcast. That'd actually be a really fascinating podcast. Not but a, not a bad when idea. He's, he's not a real investors can use. Yeah, how do you, yeah how do you use getting things done? But uh, anyway, so we can work on that later. But uh, yeah, so my my theory is this: if you only do like twenty percent of what the GTD system kind of is, if you just did a very small portion of it, that alone will do like a ton more for your business and for your life and organizing than if you do nothing, you know, like, cause I feel like I do maybe like 10 or 15, 20% of what I'm, what I wish I did, but still, I like, just like the mindset shift I had when I read that book and, and some of the little organization things I have today, even in like in my Evernote, I have my, you know, sort of like my next actionable step. And I have my someday, maybe kind of a folder in Evernote because I, I organize things in my head that way now. And just the concept of next actionable step, I think was uh, huge for me when I read that book. So anyway, I like your choice. Good job. Absolutely. Even just Evernote itself as a tool is so great yep. for, you know, real estate investors. Cause not only can you capture the, you know, the pictures of like, you know, you're strolling through Home Depot or you're strolling through like another house that one of your competitors is doing. It's like, oh, I like that backsplash, you know, just being able to like capture yeah. all that information, filter it and find it later is just an incredible tool. Yeah. Nice. I agree. Nice. All right. Hobbies other than travel. We talked about that part. Yeah. So the, the travel is like the main thing. And here recently it's just been a uh, kids, kids, kids. So, um, be it little league games, just, you know, making sure I'm, you know, spending time with them. Cause that's, you know, something critical, I think for all, you know, entrepreneurs is, you know, like what's truly important in life and you can get out there, you can kill it, you know, make a bajillion dollars, but you can never buy back the early years with your kids. So, you know, really, you know, another one of those kind of begin with the end games in mind. And, you know, if you're got a small family or thinking about having a family, you really need to take a look at your business plan, your life plan, and organize it in a way that, you know, you're never going to get those early years back. So how do I make sure that I spend the most time with them that, you know, I just money can never buy? Hey, do that you is, travel with your kids, by the way? Yeah. Um, so our oldest and, you know, it's, it's something that like people look at us like we're silly, but we'll load up the swagger wagon with all three kids and, <laughs> you know, head out to the beach or up to the mountains. We love to go camping. I was talking um, about the adventure travel, like, you know, you go to Ukraine or, or you know, 
I don't know. So I haven't, I haven't quite taken them to a, uh, any third world yet, but that's definitely okay. on the, uh, the map. We, uh, our youngest, we just had four months ago and we're not quite ready to, uh, <laughs> venture yeah. to West. Africa. Oh, come on. Little come early, on. A little early. Well, congratulations on, on that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, congratulations. That's cool. That's cool. I, I, you know, I don't have kids yet, but I always swear that someday I will be the parent that's like got the kid on my back hiking through, you know, like the Great Wall of China or something. Like I want to be that guy someday. So until you try and carry your kid on their your back for you know a half mile and you say, yeah, that's not gonna. Happen. You know what? That's why I work. That's why I work out today. So I, I'm so, preparing so for then. So here's another quick tip. Um, quick tip. As far as like you know, bringing your kids camping. I love to yeah. camp and love to bring my kids camping. And, you know, camping is great because it takes you outside of your element. You know, you're not in your day-to-day routine, but there's a drawback to that. So, you know, at our house, you know, there's bath time, there's bedtime, there's jammies, there's all these things. Well, camping, there's campfire and there's beer and, <laughs> and more beer. And you, you don't kind of get in your routine. So, like, the first time I took my uh, son camping, you know, bring a buddy, we're having a good time. And it's like, all right, son, let's go to bed. We're sharing a sleeping bag. I forgot to put his pull-up on. And let's just say oh. I woke up uh, <laughs> a little excess moisture in the, uh, the sleeping bag. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. 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 Fabulous, man. Great story. Yeah. All right. <laughs> all right. Final question of the world famous, famous four. And that is, what do you believe sets apart successful real estate investors from those who give up, fail, or never get started? Uh, I think it you know, goes back to that question of how and also just you know having a plan. Like so many people – you know, they might be a dreamer, like, oh, you know, here's my goals. But, you know, they don't have a plan to accomplish those goals. So, you know, whatever it is, you know, you're looking to do, whether it be, you know, getting started in wholesaling, fixing and flipping, you know, number one, write your goals down. But number two, you know, work backwards. Like, what is the plan? Like, who are the the people I need to meet? You know, what are the appointments I need to make? You know, what are the investments in my education? all these other things that I need to do to prepare myself to actually make that, you know, dream a reality. That's great. That's great. All right. Well, Todd, this, this has been a really, really fantastic show. Lots of, lots of good information. You know, before I ask you about how people can find out more about you, I need you to just say, just say, just say cool whip. Cool whip. Ah, oh, you did it right. <laughs> there was no cool whip. I was waiting for the cool whip. <laughs> is that an Atlanta thing? Is this kind of like one of those like drawer and draw? Something, I I, you know, <laughs> it's, it's one of those draws. southern things that you always hear the cool whip. That's Bust funny. out the cool whip. Yeah. Oh, well, I thought I thought I'd hear it, but I, I didn't. All right, man. Well, where can people? <laughs> I tried. All right. Where can people find out more about you, bud? On the front porch drinking sweet tea. <laughs> uh, so on Bigger Pockets, that's probably like the preferred place. And, uh, I don't have enough friends for or enough time for the friends I have now. So probably just hit me up on LinkedIn. We'll just kind of keep it on a, a professional level. <laughs> nice. But, uh, cool. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much. And we definitely appreciate your time. And, and uh, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun hearing your story. And anybody who wants to ask a question to Todd about uh, you know, this interview or anything else, you can also post on the show notes at biggerpockets.com slash show 104. All right, Todd. Thanks a lot, man. Cool. And actually, I've got a quick, quick question that like oh, yeah. I'll probably ask for like the greater good of the bigger pockets community. I know I have this question, and hopefully, there's an answer to it. And if not, then oh well, this is always going to be it's going to be. So way back when, when I first made my bigger pockets profile, like I had to make like a username, and I probably should have just like made it like my name, like you know at Todd Wooden, but I didn't. I like was somehow stuck in like video game mode, and. I <laughs> My video game guy's like the Duke of Death. Nice. And I was like, that's probably not like a good thing to be like the Duke <laughs> of Death on this real estate site. So I just shortened it to the Duke. So if I want to change it now to something different, is that possible? And how do I do it? That is possible. You would contact our support team at support at biggerpockets.com and they will take care of you and they will ensure that the Duke becomes Todd Whitten. <laughs> Todd Whitten, Whitten. <laughs> it's just kind of a hard name to uh, yeah 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 yeah, yeah so like we'll, we'll, we'll get you taken care of yeah and anyone listening if you guys ever have questions on on using the site or or any needs that you want just uh hit us up at support at biggerpockets.com and and uh the team will take care of you we got uh you know a couple people 
doing uh, support for us and, and they're fantastic and, and can help you out with anything you need. There you awesome. go. Well, appreciate right. it, guys. Todd, it's right, been fun. Todd. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks, man. All right. Bye. See you later. All right, guys. That was show 104 with Todd Witten. Again, big thanks to Todd for coming on board. Uh, I really, really enjoyed that show and I hope you guys did as well. Yeah. I know that in, in like my business, I feel like that is the area I struggle with the most is turning it into a business versus how I've always done things. Right. So yeah. I love shows like that where I'm like, oh man, there's so many ways that I should be doing things differently and better. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of inspiring. So anyway, I definitely awesome. got a lot out of it. Yeah. Yeah. And listen, I mean, it's so easy to get overwhelmed and say, oh, there's a million things I want to do. And, and, you know, and since I didn't do all million, I'm a big fat failure. And, and, th- and that's not true. I mean, if you listen to these shows and take away one thing and, you know, implement one thing to improve your business, then it's worth it. You know, it's worth listening to and it's worth the time. So uh, definitely, you know, stop and think about some of this stuff. And, you know, I'll challenge you to that, Brandon. You know, don't don't go and make a list of 20 things because you're going to pull your hair out, right? You know, pick one or two and, and go with it. Yeah, there you go. I pull my hair out anyway, but, you know. Yeah, well, you know. Yeah, I got a haircut today. Did you see that? Uh, you know, I did not notice. Um, it still kind of looks like a rat's <laughs> nest. So, you know. <laughs> don't tell my wife that. She cut it. <laughs> Oh, it looks really <laughs> good, Heather, if you're listening. This is, you know, well well done. Well done. Thank you. See, All it's... right, time for me to go. <laughs> so with that, guys, listen, thanks for listening to the show. Thanks for being a part of Bigger Pockets. If you're not already an active member of our community, jump in, create an account at biggerpockets.com. Otherwise, we'll see you around social media, and we'll see you around next week for the show 105 of the Bigger Pockets podcast. You know what you forgot to say? Nope. If you haven't given us a review or rating yet, iTunes, come on. Okie dokie. If you haven't yet given us a rating <laughs> or review, please do jump on iTunes and, and leave us one. It does help us a lot. Um, and we definitely appreciate all the feedback and, and take it all to heart. So thank we you do. so much. All right. Thank you, people. Right, Brandon. Thanks. I'm out of here. All right. This is Brandon signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.